Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, webinar two of Demystifying Medicine. Um, today, I'll just be giving a brief introduction to our speaker. We have Dr. Olaf Kraus de Camargo presenting today. Um, Dr. Olaf is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at McMaster University. He completed his medical education and pediatric training in Brazil, followed by a residency in Germany where he received training in developmental behavioral pediatrics and child neurology. Prior to joining the faculty at McMaster, Dr. Olaf held positions in Germany as a professor of social medicine at the University of Applied Sciences, Nordosen, and as CEO and medical director of Kinderzentrum Pelzer Hacken uh, GMBH, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, um, an inpatient and outpatient facility for children with developmental behavioral disabilities and chronic neurological disorders. Dr. Olaf is a scientist at the CAN Child Center for Ch Childhood Disability Research and a member of Mac Art McMaster Autism Research Team. He practices as a developmental pediatrician at the Ron Joyce Children's Health Center in Hamilton, Ontario. Since 2001, Dr. Olaf has been involved with the implementation of the World Health Organization International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health, ICF. He co-edited the book, ICF, a hands-on approach for clinicians and families. So I'd like to welcome him to present today. Take it away. Thank you very much, Sonia, for this kind introduction. And you really managed well all these difficult uh, words in Portuguese <laughs> and German. <laughs> Uh, it's Thank you. A challenge. Um, so I, I'm really excited to be at this uh, session today of demystifying medicine, and I had an awesome introduction uh, about the background of this uh, sessions with Kieto, and uh, I hope that my my topic uh, will fit well into this. Uh, <clears throat> how to become a great physician uh, sounds a bit uh, bold and. Uh, presumptive, and uh, that is the purpose of the title. Uh, as was mentioned, I was trained in Brazil, and yesterday in Brazil was uh, the Brazilian National Doctors' Day. And uh, if you look into different countries, they have Doctors' Day on different days in the year. And in Brazil, being a very uh, religious country, the Doctors' Day is the day of St. Luke, because St. Luke uh, was supposed to be a doctor, and that shows a bit the uh, the image that physicians have uh, in that country. It's like a saint-like uh, uh, person. And <clears throat> I think too easily we we think about these qualities of physicians as being something uh, that is only re related to the personality. Of course, uh, it, you have an inclination. You want to help people. You want to be in this field. And you have also curiosity about nature and science. Uh, but what I will try to show is that a lot of these things that make a great physicians actually can be taught. Uh, this uh, presentation will have some interactive uh, elements. And if you have a phone, you can scan this QR code there or you can open another uh, browser window and go on www.menti.com and use that code 58883333. Uh, so you can also participate a little bit despite uh, us all being so distant from each other. <clears throat> I will leave it a couple of minutes so people can take note of that. So if you are now on on menti.com, let's start with a, a very simple exercise. Uh, define a great physician. So on the next slide here, you will have uh, the menti.com slide on your device or in your browser. And you have the option to uh, share three words that according to your expectations and experiences define a great physician. Let's see what, what people think about that.
So I think we come now, we have 32 participants already or people, and we have here three words that really stick out is knowledgeable, empathetic and compassionate. Uh, excellent. I will move on. So I think that gave you an idea what people usually uh, think of as a great physician. Uh, this is a definition that is from William Osler and William Osler uh, is close to us here. He was a while in, in Dundas, so it's a person close to McMaster, at least geographically. And he over 130 years ago would uh, coin this phrase, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And this will be the threat for my talk from here on. We have two elements here that uh, we need to discuss and we need to learn about the disease and the patient. So what do we learn about diseases or what do we have to learn about diseases and how do we care for diseases? Uh, we learn about pain, we learn about fever, about different dysfunctions of all types of, of body uh, systems, uh, different types of structural lesions, and we rely on health professionals and the healthcare system uh, to deal with all these issues and try to uh, cure diseases or diminish their impacts on the patient. Now on the patient side, what we see is things that have more to do with suffering, fear, limitations of the activities, restrictions of where they can participate in the social life, in their work at school when we talk about children. Uh, we need the family involved in the support of the, of the patient and we need to consider what they uh, do usually in their life as an example work or school but could also be leisure or, or the other activities, hobbies, things that are meaningful for the patient. So these are the aspects that we need to address in order to become great physicians. So let's look, have a look at uh, medical schools where physicians are being trained. And in the next slide, I will ask you to rank by importance that you put on what you think within an university, within a medical school, are indicators that help to make great physicians. So we have the faculty to student ratio, the MCAT GPA scores of the students, uh, the amount of research dollars that people uh, get, and the rating by other doctors. So ha let's have a look at that. And you have the four options here, and you can rate them according to what you think is the most important to make a great physician. So we have about 30 <coughs> responses for now. I think that already shows. I, I'm very glad that you believe that the faculty to student ratio is the most important characteristic. Uh, at second, you put in the, the ratings by other doctors. Third, the research dollars and your own performance in MCAT GPA you put in the, uh, on the last position. Interesting. If you look into official rankings of medical schools, that is how the ranking is weighed. So the weights for research activity is the highest. After that comes the rating by other uh, doctors. Then comes the student selectivity of a medical school. And the last, 
and less important uh, in official rankings of medical schools is are the faculty resources. So that is something to to reflect on and and discuss. And uh, I believe that this type of uh, looking at a medical school and at the importance or the reputation of a medical school uh, might be also responsible for the type of students and this type of, of physicians that we are able to uh, to create. So in McMaster, and I will go along this timeline here along my, my talk, we have the motto, a brighter world, and I put in here a brighter future because I want us to uh, think about how we can move forward. McMaster has a history of uh, over a century, 130 years. Uh, the medical school is much younger than that. And uh, several important aspects of education and science have been developed here at McMaster. One of the aspects that you all are familiar with is the aspect of problem based learning, which was introduced in the 70s, is therefore almost half a uh, century old already. So it's something that uh, none of you probably was born when it was uh, developed. So it's a really a traditional type of teaching already. And if I travel uh, even through Brazil, uh, many uh, medical schools there apply this model uh, developed at McMaster, and that's one of the elements that if you go internationally, people will refer to, oh, you're from McMaster, that's where problem-based learning was developed. So we're very proud about that, and we're also very proud about the concept of evidence-based medicine also developed here at McMaster, and that is uh, was in the 90s, so almost uh, 30 years ago. And that's a concept that is also taught here at, uh, at McMaster. Uh, <clears throat> and students learn that in their tutorials. You will see a lot of uh, discussions and papers about different therapy options, for example, for different conditions. And you are asked to evaluate the evidence for those uh, therapy opportunities. So uh, we have a strong scientific uh, foundation in our education and you learn how about how to get the best external evidence about a problem and we also have a great input from individual clinicians through all the tutors that you are involved so you have a high ratio of faculty that uh, is available for the students and can share their own individual clinical expertise uh, and these two aspects are very well well done at McMaster. Uh, these are aspects that help to know a lot about diseases, help to know a lot about how to treat these diseases and <clears throat> are sufficient to create good physicians. But it is not completely evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is something that also includes, besides the best external evidence, the individual clinical expertise, also the patient values and the expectations. So the patient has a very important role uh, in that uh, consideration, and only the overlap of all the three is what is defined as evidence-based medicine, because every decision and every clinical decision needs to be taken in perspective of these individual patient values and expectations. We can therefore define a great physician if you teach all these three aspects, the science, the clinical expertise, and the patient aspect of healthcare. So how do we do that? Here are some tools that I want to describe to you from which I think uh, can be helpful in developing a curriculum and in teaching these aspects that I just described to you. The first is the ICF and it was mentioned in the introduction. That's the International Classification of Function, Disability and Health and it was developed by the WHO. And the second is a concept that uh, colleagues and, and I describe as everyday ethics. It's not the the ethics of life and death decisions, but it's the ethics of uh, when do I tell a patient what his diagnosis is? I had a conversation like that today about a child with a rare syndrome and the mother wanted to know if the child is old enough to understand what the syndrome means. 
let's go first into the ICF. So it, the ICF is already 20 years old now, 19 years to be exact. And uh, this morning uh, was a WHO meeting uh, at which I participated and the recent version of ICF, the ICF 2020 was just uh, released. So it is uh, also something that is around already for some time and in many countries it is uh, applied. What is the ICF? It is a framework based on the biopsychosocial model. And uh, in that framework, you will have uh, different elements that all together will describe the functioning or disability of a person or their uh, status within these two extremes between disability and complete ability. So you have a person that has some health condition, which is usually defined to some uh, functional impairments or structural lesions. Uh, that person will have some limitations in the activities and some restriction in her participation, depending on which environmental factors uh, are supporting her or are barriers for her. So you have here the, the biological aspect of the, of the model, and then you have the, bio, uh, the psychosocial aspects in these elements here. And <clears throat> if you remember the characteristics of diseases and patients, you can see they all fit nicely here in the different elements of the ICF. In that sense, the ICF is also called a holistic model because it encompasses all the aspects of the life of a person beyond their uh, health condition or, or diagnosis. Um, the other aspect that you need to consider is having that framework, how do I get the information that is so relevant for the patient? How do I get the information about what are the values of the patient? What is important for the patient? What is this, that patient afraid of? What are the specific fears of that patient? And there are uh, two examples that I want to bring up. Uh, one is the use of narrative medicine, and the second is the use of patient reported outcomes. Narrative medicine and uh, these uh, definitions I f could not simplify in shorter sentence, so I have to read them for you. But it's the narrative knowledge that is that one uses to understand the meaning and significance of stories through cognitive, symbolic, and affective means. So that is the description of the direct interaction between you and a patient trying to understand what actually happened to you, how did it happen, what does that mean for you, what is the importance of that for you, and then how can I help you with that. And unlike its complement, the logical scientific knowledge, so all the knowledge that we have acquired about uh, physiopathology, about uh, substances that we can use for uh, influencing certain um, molecular uh, processes or even genetic processes, all this knowledge which theoretically you could put into an algorithm and uh, let a computer analyze all the possibilities and what are the least uh, side effects and what's the highest probability of, of cure. That is one aspect. The narrative knowledge complements it with uh, the understanding of what is really unique about that one patient and about that situation that you're dealing with. So in that sense, narrative medicine actually is what allows uh, a personalized medicine to happen. And it can therefore help us to better understand the experiences of sick people, which we cannot just by lab values or images. And to better measure these aspects, we can focus ourselves on what we call patient reported outcomes. So these are outcomes that are defined by what is important for the patient, what comes directly from them unfiltered. It's not decided by a, a clinician or a scientist. Uh, they help us to focus on what is the individual goal and can help us both in the way what are we going to diagnose? Is that really important to get to know this diagnosis? Is it, Will it make a difference in the life of the patient? Is it important for the patient? Especially if you think about gen, uh, genetic workups, for example. 
And it can help us also to think about what can we do for the management of a certain condition and how can that be uh, developed. Some therapies, uh, even if they're not medical therapies in my field, a lot of therapies are provided by other people, are behavioral therapies, speech therapies, physiotherapy, and so on. All these therapies, uh, they take away time out of the life of a person, of a child, of a family to achieve a certain objective. And you need always to weigh uh, if that is really uh, meaningful and will make a, a difference in the eye of the patient. And to assess these uh, patient reported outcomes, a series of tools have been developed. They are called uh, PROMs or patient reported outcome measures, which have been standardized, have been validated, which can be applied in a variety of, uh, of health conditions and situations, allowing us to measure uh, in a more reliable way if the goal that we have defined in a shared decision process between patient and, and clinicians are actually being reached and if they are uh, the effort that we're doing to reach that goal is uh, adequate for that and uh, does more good than harm in the life of these patients. So in that sense, it helps us also to make what I mentioned before, these everyday ethical decisions. Ethical decisions usually are defined by these four elements, beneficence, doing good, non-maleficence, not doing harm, respecting the independence of the person, the autonomy, and justice, fairness. So uh, just access to care. And the moral issues that often arise are not always about should this child be reanimated or not, should this patient with COVID receive a respirator or not. It is of all the little decisions that we make, they have their impacts and they have their uh, significance for a family and for their patients. And it can be something simple as the cost of a medication. And we need to weigh if uh, that medication that we are thinking is the best choice from what we know from the science is actually the best choice for that family that is struggling with a lot of other uh, financial issues as well. So these are principles that we need to learn how to weigh them and how to elicit them and make patients comfortable in bringing up these uh, topics and sharing their concerns with us. If we do not do that, we might have patients that do not do the things that have been prescribed or have been uh, told to do, and those then are easily described as non-compliant patients. They're not doing what the doctor orders said, but actually the, the fault is with the doctor who did not elicit enough information about the patient in order to make the right decisions. So knowing the narrative, understanding the biopsychosocial connections between all these elements that define uh, the functioning of a person helps us to engage in an ethical shared decision making process. Now, after the ICF has been developed, another 10 years forward, there was published, and it's down here uh, by Frank and colleagues, a uh, paper in The Lancet, a commission paper from The Lancet about the need for reforms in the medical education. And the main driver for that was the increase worldwide, not only in, in the industrialized countries, but in also low and middle income uh, countries of chronic diseases. There are huge numbers of people with diabetes in India, for example. There are many non-communicable diseases that are now uh, a major health issue worldwide. And it was felt 10 years ago that the health professionals that we are uh, creating are not actually well prepared to deal with that uh, population. So Frank and his colleagues have this uh, table in their uh, paper, which uh, summarizes briefly what I have said so far. So we had uh, certain revolutions and reforms in health education. We had the science-based reform, 
stressing more the importance of basic sciences. We had the problem based learning uh, developed here at McMaster. And now forward, we are looking into something that is more system based, which is required to have more interaction between different health professionals. It's not a unique uh, solitary one man sh uh, show, but it's a team sport where everybody has uh, to work together, not only uh, in the health, but also in the education systems in order to pr provide the development of healthcare professionals that can deal with these new uh, conditions and the new numbers as well of conditions. And many of these uh, systems will require uh, initiatives that are locally uh, focused, that have community-based services, but also within a global agenda of uh, developing a healthier society. So how has McMaster dealt with these developments over the last uh, 50 years? So we have several medical foundations which focus on the scientific aspect and the evidence base of treatment of se several of these conditions. So you see here MF1 is the respiratory cardiovascular systems, the renal hematological systems, nutrition, energy, homeostasis, reproduction, locomotion, neurosensory behavior issues. And then we have now recently a new uh, foundation, complex multi-system diseases, chronic illness, which tries to address, I think, uh, these issues that have come up over the last uh, 10 years. Besides these uh, foundations, we also have the professional competencies. And in these, we learn about effective communication, about medical decision making, which I would prefer to rename into shared decision making, about moral reasoning, ethical judgment, health equity and determinants of health, professionalism, self-awareness, social, cultural, humanistic dimensions of health and interprofessional education. So these are uh, quite separated uh, streams uh, through which the students go through. And uh, we were thinking that uh, it is time for a new revolution here, a new reform at McMaster. We had a big space since the evidence-based medicine and what we're proposing now it would be a more integrated medical education or in-med as uh, an example. Uh, integrated medical education would allow us to have a continuum of all these tools that we mentioned before. We have the scientific tools, we have the uh, biomedical research, evidence-based medicine teaching. We have also the framework in the ICF and the basic uh, ethical principles as a foundation and we learn how to elicit the patient's voice with narrative medicine techniques and the use of patient reported outcomes. So the ICF would be the foundation to organize the narratives that uh, people collect. Uh, the ethical reflection would be used actively on many investigational therapy options within a shared decision making process with the patient. And third, we would explore and choose uh, patient rated outcomes together with patients in order to understand what is important for them to enable their participation in the goals that are important for them. And all that would happen not just in one professional uh, course, but like you are doing in this elective here in an interprofessional team, but that would include interprofessional teams not only in the medical uh, not only in, in one elective course, but would go through all the health professional uh, education. So such an integrated model would not mean really adding new stuff to the curriculum, but it would mean to embed the, uh, the processes of how we collect information and how we collaborate with each other on this side throughout all the different medical foundations uh, that students learn. It would require rephrasing many of the uh, case examples in the tutorials in order to facilitate that discuss discussion to happen as well within, um, within these uh, medical uh, foundation discussions. So I think William Osler was, uh, was wise and I think his uh, phrase is still valid. Uh, it was probably more an intuition at that time, but uh, we have a lot of 
tools now available that allow us to really teach every student to become a great physician. So recapitulating in the last uh, 130 years, we moved from the foundation of MAC to problem-based learning, evidence-based medicine. We had developments from WHO with the ICF, which is a, a fantastic framework for all of us in healthcare and education. We have the awareness of the need for education reform in, in healthcare professional education. And we have a proposal to do that here at McMaster for a brighter future. I want to acknowledge here uh, my dear colleagues, Gabriel Ronan, Peter Rosenbaum. Uh, the three of us discussed these ideas a lot over the last two years, and we uh, bounced them back and forth with our colleague, Kenny McAssey, and our colleague in Brussels, Bernard Dunn. And this is published in a paper uh, which is mentioned here, which you can uh, download free and get some more information, and more details about the background and the literature used for this discussion. So I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to uh, discuss and answer questions. I think my uh, two co-authors might also be online now and can join in our discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Olaf. Um, so we have a few questions that have come in on the Q&A. Um, so I can just read them out to you and then we can go ahead with the discussion for the questions. So the first question we have is how do we assess soft skills, uh, perhaps the most important in the selection process of new doctors? <laughs> um, yeah, it's certainly a, uh, a great question. How do you select that? Um, I think the difficulty is not so much how you select it, but the difficulty is uh, dealing with more people interested than you have uh, available spots. Uh, and uh, these processes probably select themselves a little bit once you have them in. I, I don't think that I would try to select them a priori uh, because it's very difficult to to get that in an interview or in a uh, in a short uh, paper as well or uh, in an impulse paper that somebody writes. So I, I think I would not use that in the in the selection process. Uh, during the teaching process, I think it is a lot of. Uh, well, yes, Peter says that he cannot figure out how to talk, so maybe Kettle can help him. Uh, I think in the uh, evaluation of the students during their course. Uh, I feel that the tutorials and the problem based learning actually have quite a good way to provide feedback within the tutorials, both uh, from the professionals and also the the colleagues. And I think that should be enough. I wouldn't want to to rate that or give a grade on that. But I think that interaction is how we learn. It's it's a collegial, collaborative way to learn things. I don't know if that answered the question. Maybe Peter wanted to say something. Um, is he able to speak at this point? Peter, if you try to click on a microphone button, there must be a way to unmute you. I think uh, uh, Peter is uh, logged in as an anonymous, so he need to log out and log back in as uh, as himself, and then he would be able to talk. I know that uh, Dr. Ronan would be able to provide a comment he if he wants. If not, we'll proceed to the next question while uh, Peter is trying to log in again. So I think the next question was, um, how do we integrate the patient's perspective? I imagine the question that means, how do we integrate the patient's perspective in teaching or in clinical practice? I'm not quite sure. Uh, 
so before we in the preparation for this uh, session, Kietl was telling me how this idea of demystifying medicine came up and uh, sharing an uh, experience from the NIH where they had regular rounds about certain conditions. And these rounds were actually modeled according to the EBM model that I, I showed you with the three circles. So it would there would be one topic about a certain health condition and there would be a presentation by a scientist who researches in that area. There would be a presentation by a clinician or a physician who treats patients in that area and a presentation by one of the patients uh, to share their perspective. So I think having that exposure to per, uh, patient perspectives is really helpful in, in learning that aspect. Uh, we try a little bit to simulate that with um, patient actors, uh, but mostly what we do in these simulations is to address uh, more clinical skills, not so much the soft skills, and the patients are not real patients, they are actors. So I, I think integrating more real patients and patient advocates into the curriculum or into the teaching sessions would be really helpful in that sense. Thank you. Um, I can move on to the next question. I'm not sure if um, Peter, are you have you signed back in? You want to add to anything? He's unfortunately unable. Peter, to Peter wrote here, think of medical education as an yes, apprenticeship. Apprentice. Right. And and that's you need to you need to be exposed and you need to practice these things. Uh, you cannot teach them just with lectures. OK, the next question is, do you think the medical school admission process in Canada is fair? Curious <laughs> to hear your opinion. Um, so I, I have not gone through the process, so I'm not uh, so so well informed maybe about that. I, I think that has been done a, a whole lot of attempts to have these different uh, mini interviews to have uh, papers written plus obviously the the marks and 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 so on i don't think it is the most adequate selection process i, I can give you an example uh, I, I was born in germany and i grew up in in brazil and uh, after and i went to a german school in brazil so after finishing my my diploma in at that german school i had planned to study medicine in in Germany, and my marks would not be sufficient to to do that. So I ended up studying in Brazil, thinking of transferring eventually to German uh, university. But the the learning in Brazil was so much hands on, and every time I spoke with colleagues in Germany, they were just amazed all, with all the exposure that I had and that they couldn't have in in Germany. So I stayed in Brazil and continued my education there and ended up doing residency there, and only went later to to Germany and had then a, a career in Germany. And now I'm here. So uh, obviously the system in in Germany, which was only based on on your marks from high school, is not fair. And I think the Canadian system is trying to uh, make it better, but any system of selection uh, will always be unfair. Uh, I think we need to make it transparent. Uh, it needs to be clear for everyone uh, how it works. There will be always uh, great physicians who will be missed and not accepted into the system despite they having all the great skills and, and possibilities to become great physicians. Um, but I think that's a, a problem of the limitation of, of spots and not of the process itself. It will be impossible to make it fair for everyone without having enough spots for everyone. Thank you. Um, the next question is, are there challenges convincing medical schools or others in the scientific community to adopt an integrated medical education model? Yes, they are. <laughs> so these ideas are, are, it's not the first time that I present them and they have been presented to the uh, council at the university for the education council and uh, suggested there. Um, 
especially the the ICF as a framework, uh, I find is extremely important to be introduced early in, in health education. And there are other countries who are doing that already. In South Africa, for example, uh, they're doing that well. In, in Brazil, several universities are doing it. So um, I think that is a, a fundamental um, change of view about health that uh, would be required in order to have health professionals in the future that have also that different uh, view on on disease and disability and what is health actually so you can get in in lots of discussions there um, it is often felt that this is uh, too much work and what we're doing is a good job and uh, i feel it is time to to innovate and I, I remember then the colleagues that if you look back in the history and look when problem based learning was proposed the first time in the 70s, there was a lot of resistance of the scientists from the basic sciences uh, saying that it's impossible to teach uh, doctors without uh, them having a good foundation just in anatomy and in biochemistry and and all these um, uh, scientific subjects. And now we, we're integrating all that and it works quite well. And in the same way, I think you can integrate all these uh, patient related aspects of healthcare within the clinical uh, uh, examples and, and tutorials and have the discussions uh, at the same time when you're discussing a new treatment or a physiopathology or signs and symptoms of a condition, you also bring up the, um, the ethical aspects of it and the different pers uh, patient perspectives or different options that you might have for a certain condition for treatment. And you could integrate that all without extending the, the course. You would just uh, distribute the uh, different uh, medical foundations, uh, integrating all the time that you already spend with the uh, uh, ProComp uh, sessions, but integrate it into, into one topic. Thank you so much. Uh, we're getting an inflow of a lot of questions, so I'll move along to the next one. Uh, would you please give an example of how narrative medicine can be applied? Um, so when I, sometimes it's easier when I contrast things. So uh, medicine is moving very fast to an aspect that is more and more uh, structured, especially through the uh, the adoption of electronic health records. And more and more what we see now is colleagues uh, having templates for all different conditions. So they have a template for a new epilepsy patient, they have a template for new diabetes patients, and they have their different templates and uh, produce very detailed reports uh, but they are all driven by the questions that clinicians have. And uh, so you ask about weight, you ask about pain, you ask about all the different things and you check them all off and then you have a beautiful report that you can send off and you covered all your bases and you did what is supposed to be done according to certain guidelines, but you did not get to know the patient and you don't know what the patient issues actually are. And uh, the narrative aspect of applying the narrative uh, medicine aspect i don't think it would take more time but it would be it's a different position how you start your whole conversation how you uh, elicit aspects that are uh, maybe not directly relevant for the diagnosis or for the treatment but are directly relevant to to the life of the people so i i always remember our colleague peter rosenbaum usually ask patients or parents, we see children with disabilities and in, in different impairments, there's always the question, now you please brag about your child. What are you proud of? What can your child do? What is what is the latest thing that your child learned? And, and so on. Or uh, talk, what do your parents think about all this? What do your in-laws think about that? So these are aspects that elicit, and that's why we call it narrative, elicit the patient to talk and to tell the story, what is behind that. And I think that 
uh, really elicits valuable information that helps us to make the decisions together with the patients of what should be the next steps or diagnostic steps or therapeutic steps. Do you hear me? Yeah. Do you Gabi. hear me? Yes. Do you hear yes. Me? Well, OK, thank, thank you very much. Uh, this has been quite a struggle to get in. But uh, to your question, I wanted to give the example of headaches. I've seen many, many patients with headaches. And somebody comes with headaches. It can be many causes. Some of them are migraines and some other causes. And the easy thing and faster thing is just to give a medication for headache. But it's more the narrative medicine really that can guide you what are the stresses in the life of these people without asking them directly. And I was always surprised to see how often I come to a conclusion that there is social pressure, child abuse, and other issues that are far, that you can't get directly by answering because patients don't like to tell you from the beginning, yes, I'm abused or uh, I live in a terrible social situation. So for me, the narrative really brings me to the cause of the issues and helps me decide how to put uh, relevant uh, remediation or intervention to those people without putting them necessarily on a headache medication. Yeah, that's a good example. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad uh, we got that working and you're able to. Oh, sorry about that. So the next question is. Um, when are students given the option to practice these skills during medical school? Are they eased in? Like, are they told to tell a patient they are dying as a way to practice? Uh, I think that is not yet done uh, in a systematic way. It is depends a lot of your preceptor and where you're rotating and how much time uh, a preceptor will take to uh, to get them in. So I, I see more um, residents. I don't have many students working with me and uh, but even when they are medical students, uh, usually uh, we have sessions where they observe and then uh, depending how long they they are with us and how comfortable they feel I give them the option to to give feedback uh, it's not about dying in in our case but it is about uh, for example uh, giving a diagnosis of of autism or giving a diagnosis uh, or just describing uh, what would be next steps to find out what might be going on what would be necessary to do about that so I um, Usually what we do, we, we coach them in the master room before we go uh, into the, to speak with the patient and then uh, they take the lead and I jump in when, when necessary. So that is maybe the, uh, the way that I'm experiencing it, but I'm not aware of specific programs that uh, teach that with the patients. And it would be so easy to teach it if you take a patient who had a heart attack. You really want to know what they're doing, what their life is all about and how and where to. And it opens up uh, for many interventional opportunities in social life in work in family life and exercise and so on. Thank you. Um, so we have about five more questions. So the next one is, um, I would love to hear what you think about allowing more students to shadow physicians before they apply to medical school. Um, and the student talks about how they've had some friends that have entered medical school and the expectations that they had did not meet the reality of the actual job and they ended up dropping out. 
Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts about shadowing? I think it's definitely helpful. I would recommend that to anybody to try to do that, uh, to have that opportunity to, to learn how is the, uh, of course you shadow one doctor, you only see uh, how this person works. Um, I worked as a, before I entered medicine, I worked a while, I shadowed or I worked in, in nursing and helped out in a, in a ward for, for a month. That was like a, a, a summer job and gave me some idea how the, how is the business within a hospital, but still didn't tell me how it is if you're a family doctor or a specialist and so on. But it, it gets you some idea how it is to, and I think that that's the important aspect. Do you like to work with people? Do you like to engage with people? And do you like to, uh, to also, uh, be touched by people and 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 that's not something that everybody feels comfortable with and i think that is the most important aspect to to check out before you commit to such a a, a career i i would like to uh, add yes and dr rosen I'd like to add that there is sorry go ahead a lot of fun knowing the patients themselves as individuals yeah have the whole a whole life around them, not just a certain disease. And it, it, it also enriches your own life by knowing those people and their environment. OK. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you. Um, so the next question is, how do you feel about the lottery system used at McMaster this year? Do you think a better system could have been used to reflect the professional competencies you mentioned? So I'm not really aware if it's, is it just a lottery or there are other components as well that are looked at? I'm, I'm not so familiar with that, sorry. Do you know that, Sonia? Um, I believe there's three different com components um, from my knowledge in terms of how they assess. So I, yeah, I'm not really sure um, mm. what exactly is meant by the lottery system. Um, from what I'm aware, uh, they look at those three different components, which includes um, the GPA, MCAT, and the CASPER. Uh, that's uh, that's what I know mm -hmm. for, for admissions. Uh, maybe I, we can I, move on to... I think it, it just reflects the difficulty in, in finding these or defining these aspects, and it's probably uh, fairer to have a lottery uh, than to judge somebody as having low uh, soft skills or low uh, professional competencies early in the career when they still can acquire those. So um, I think the lottery is probably a fairer aspect. I can't talk to the advantage or disadvantage. Uh, I think the system that Olaf so nicely presented is that anybody can learn it and apply it. Mm -hmm. You don't need the internal knowledge how to prepare yourself to see patients and to look after patients. I think this is a nice system that everybody can learn and apply in their daily clinical practice. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Rosenbaum has actually commented um, that uh, a good reference to some of the topics that are touched upon today um, is a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine by uh, Eric Cassell. Um, and he basically mentions that it's an essential explanation of what this presentation is about. So um, we can post uh, this link so students can maybe get a better idea with reading this paper. It is, it is um, also and moving on. Uh, it's mentioned in the paper, it's recited in our paper that I mentioned in the link. Excellent, okay. Perfect, and so that should give a little bit of clarity. Dr. Roland just asked me to show the book. 
<laughs> about ICF, so that's also a resource to, to learn about it. But I think it's also referenced okay. in the article. Perfect. Um, so we have time for a few more questions, so I'll just uh, go over the last couple. Um, so the next one is, what do you think is or would be the most difficult or challenging aspect of system-based revolution? For instance, would the education or health system side be more difficult to implement changes in? That's an excellent question, yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel that uh, the education could actually uh, move faster because it is uh, not such a big administration as a, as a government is or a health system is. So I, I would rather uh, start in the in the university and uh, create the the agents of change, which will be the the future health professionals that then will also change the system. If there is a Thank will, you. there's a way. Um. That's what people usually say. <laughs> OK, and uh, I'll just present you with one last question to wrap up. Um, how are medical students taught to translate medical language to the public? For example, if a child is diagnosed with a complicated condition, how would you get one of the residents to describe it to the patient's parents? Yeah. <laughs> Also, an excellent question. How we how we prepare that? I think one one way. Uh, what I understood is this elective. <laughs> so you you preparing students to uh, assess complex information and how to make it easier to understand and and understand. So that's I think a, a great initiative in, in that sense. Uh, in the practical situation, I would do it similarly. What I mentioned before with the examples that we. Uh, would coach them and uh, see what what how would you describe it and be sure also that they are familiar with the family so it's no sense of somebody going in and discussing something like that if they don't have a good relationship already with the patients and the, their family uh, just for the sake of training it so i wouldn't do that that's not ethical but um, if they are related with the or with the case and have involved been involved then obviously yes they should do it can I add a few minor tricks? Sure. Uh, one is uh, be at the same eye level as your patient. So if the patient's sitting on the floor, sit yourself on the floor and look at the patient, uh, look at their eyes, talk to them in their own language. Uh, you can engage in some activities uh, initially to get their trust and it's kind of, it evolves time, but it's worth it because you really develop a potentially long-term relationship. The other thing which I also learned from Peter Rosenbaum is that parents also develop uh, with their condition of their child. So when you explain things to parents, you have to understand you can't load them with everything in the first situation, you have to guide them through a longer period of time. And somebody else is raising their hand here. Is that Alex? Don't hear anything. Sonia, you are muted. Uh, sorry, who had raised their hands? I don't. Uh... I couldn't see it yet. OK. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't see it either. 
Okay, so that just about wraps up today's uh, uh, webinar. I'd like to give a big thank you to um, Dr. Olaf, as well as uh, Dr. Rosenbaum um, and Dr. Ronan. Thank you all for contributing and teaching us about uh, this very interesting topic. Um, I hope that all the questions were covered. Uh, I did try to get through most of the questions as much as possible. Um, you can always reach out to Dr. Olaf, I'm sure, if you have any uh, other questions to ask. And of course, reach out to Dr. Ask or myself, um, should you require yeah. any direction to reach so out I to Dr. Be Olaf. I yeah. interested in, in seeing what comes out of that. So Dr. Ask mentioned that there might be uh, like a, a noise translation projects out of these talks. So if there's something being developed, I would be really interested to, to see that and uh, see what what comes out of it thank you very much for that opportunity thank you so much